now to talk more about what that change in government means for the UK and for the world. We're joined by Benjamin Tallis, Senior Research Fellow at German Council on Foreign Relations. Good to have you on the early edition. Good morning. Pleasure to be back with you. Now, the, the first reactions here, I mean, we're looking at a completely different government, but at the same time, what does this mean for security? What does this mean for Ukraine? Well, one of the features of British politics over the last few years has been the cross-party support for victory uh, in Ukraine. So on that front, um, not much will change. And if it does change, it will change for the better, because the size of the Labour victory now really gives them a mandate to pursue uh, the policies they really care about. And certainly within the Labour Party and within its security and defence and foreign policy team, there are a lot of people who really understand the stakes of what's involved in Ukraine. There's bigger questions about how much they will actually end up spending on defense and so where the uh, the money to go with the mouth actually is. But I think uh, given the size of the victory, we can expect positive uh, developments. And now what are the potential implications of the new government on the UK's relationship with the EU? Well, it's a complicated one, and Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, uh, has been doing his best not to reopen the Brexit debate during this campaign. And you saw just uh, yesterday, or just the day before the election, Starmer talking about uh, his opinion that the UK will not rejoin the EU within his lifetime. And he's in his 60s, so you can make your own conclusions from that. But of course, there are a lot of people who say the only real way out of the UK's economic contradictions and economic problems would be to rejoin the uh, the customs union or the single market. I don't expect to see too much movement on that, to be honest. Labour have other priorities that they will get into first, but they might lay the groundwork for that. What we can expect to see is a more constructive relationship with European partners, a determined effort bringing energy and also governing competence. Uh, the, the Tories, the Conservatives, were basically exhausted after 14 years of government and did not have the best um, ministers in place. With Labour, they'll bring this fresh energy, and I think we can expect to see heightened cooperation with particular EU states. And, and one also, I think, um, one point that we're interested in is we've had Mr. Nigel Farage, I believe it was his eighth attempt finally to get into Parliament. He finally succeeded in that, that Reform Party. Uh, tell us about what we can expect from him in Parliament. I mean, he's someone who's been uh, jumping across the Atlantic, uh, jumping across Brussels. Uh, what's his role going to be and how complicated will that be for the next government? Yes, like, uh, I mean, his eighth time of trying, eighth time lucky, like someone who's bad at dating, his persistence is his charm, perhaps. But I don't think we can expect to see too much charm in the next parliament. He's most likely to use this platform, as he did with his European parliament seat, to take all the benefits of being within that system, uh, while at the same time railing against that system. His, but the performance of his party, though, does raise questions, because they got nearly four million votes altogether. And because of the way the UK electoral system works, that only worked out to four seats in the parliament. Uh, but what we can see in a number of areas is that the competition between his reform party and the centre-right conservatives was what allowed then Labour to win in those seats. So if they come to some kind of deal or if the conservative party moves further to the right, um, we could expect to see changes into how the voting behavior for reform would go next time. But of course, that would mean the Tories losing the center ground. And what we've just seen from this election is the center ground is where you win. And I want to quickly come back to what you uh, said earlier. You mentioned that uh, now uh, the Labour Party has uh, more immediate issues that need to be addressed. Uh, were you meaning to, to touch upon health care issues or cost of living crisis? Yes, I mean, Keir Starmer has been very clear that the best way to defeat populism is to improve people's lives. And so we can expect to see, I think, a sweeping range of practical measures to try and get government working for people. Certainly supporting the NHS is a big part of that. Of course, Labour founded the NHS back in the 1940s, and it's an issue that all British people care about very deeply, but also getting more money into public services uh, more generally and improving the delivery of those public services will be the absolute priority uh, for Starmer. Other key issues are green transformation, 
and investment in green technology to, to do that, boosting the UK's reputation further and playing on its strength as a leader in digital technology and digital government. So that's something I can uh, safely say we'll expect to see. But there are foreign policy priorities too, of course, and this uh, agenda of reconnecting Britain with the world, which is the platform or the slogan of their foreign policy platform, is something we can expect to see starting already at the NATO summit next week. Right. And I think also at the same time, I mean, people want to change. We saw that sweeping victory for Labour. We don't have all the numbers yet, but it seems uh, something much like Tony Blair had back in, in, in the 90s. Uh, but looking also the cards that he's been dealt, I mean, there is change. That's what we've heard through the speeches. But I mean, the UK isn't in the best shape. And as you said, there's division. There's certain pieces that are rather in need of repair. I mean, how, how much can he rise to do all those things that he promised? And how much of a danger are we that we get bogged down in domestic politics that Labour will be hemorrhaging votes again and we'll have another election anyway? Well, exactly. Their challenge is to make sure they deliver on domestic policy rather than getting bogged down in domestic politics. And that's that's a challenge for any government, even uh, the Blair government with its record majority after the, uh, at, at the 1997 election that you mentioned, did also succumb at times to domestic politics. But nonetheless, they delivered on an ambitious uh, domestic agenda. And that's the inspiration I think Starmer has to take here. A big question will come in terms of how serious they were in advance about not spending too much money. They didn't want to spook people that this is going to be a government of tax and spend. But ultimately, the UK needs investment. And so while you can shuffle the cards around that you have, ultimately, they are going to need to put more money into those public services I was talking about before. They're going to need to invest in Britain's future. And in, that includes its future defence uh, as well, so that the UK's material uh, actually matches uh, the quality of its talk. And so that's, I think, the real challenge for Starmer. Is he brave enough to go ahead and do that and to make the generational change that the UK actually needs? And I would love to know, zoom out perhaps ever so slightly, um, what role have leadership qualities and recent scandals now played in shaping the current political landscape within the UK? A large role, I think. It's part of the general perception in the UK that the Conservatives were no longer fit to hold the government, no longer fit for power. And we've seen a number of their um, cabinet ministers and former prime ministers, Liz Truss notably, um, lose their seats personally. So this is not just a reflection of the overall uh, landslide towards Labour, but uh, Grant Shapps, the Defence Minister, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who symbolised for many the arrogance of the Conservative Party lounging across the seats in the, uh, the House of Commons. Um, those people have lost their individual constituency seats, which of course is how the UK system works. So this has been a referendum on them and their performance too. Now, overall, um, people I think were extremely upset with the way that the government handled the pandemic, the parties in Downing Street while people uh, had to let their relatives die alone, the uh, persistent sleaze around Boris Johnson and others, the disastrous mini budget from Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak's total inability to actually govern the country, uh, to coherently actually make narrative and make it make sense to people. And the, the sense that he was out of touch played a big factor as well. So all those things together were a potent cocktail for getting rid of the Tories. But a potent cocktail indeed, and I think it will be a major story, and we'll all follow that with interest of what a new UK looks like under a new government. We'll close it there. Benjamin Tallis, thank you so much for all that. Great to be with you. Thank you.